Okay, start by um, announcing the first speaker of the day is Jake Taylor. Uh, Jake is at JQI, and Jake is going to tell us today about tabletop experiments for quantum gravity. Jake, please go ahead and share your screen. Well, first I'll mute myself mm -hmm. and say thank you very much to the organizers. It's really exciting to actually have this group of people together to be exploring this direction. A lot of what I'm talking about today, I'm going to call it um, speculative Good. in the sense that there are substantial technical and physical challenges that we're going to have to address before testing key concepts in quantum gravity can really be achieved in the laboratory. But I feel like it's an aspirational goal that is worthy of the effort. Um, my name, by the way, is Jake Taylor. I'm at the Joint Quantum Institute and the Joint Center for Quantum Information and Computer Science, or QUICS. My home agency is NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And you can find me on Twitter at quantum underscore Jake. So uh, first of all, what do we mean by a test? When you talk about testing quantum gravity, I usually think about two different pathways. One pathway is kind of a, a bottom-up pathway and the other you might call a top-down pathway. And I apologize, by the way, I'm, I'm in uh, the office right now where we have a mask protocol. And so if you, it's a little hard to hear me, uh, please accept my apologies and don't hesitate to raise your hand to ask me to say it again. So one approach basically is to sort of bottom up, like, hey, let's choose a theory. And from that theory, make a prediction. So some years ago, for example, in the world of loop quantum gravity, there was a, a prediction made that high energy photons might go slower. And you can disagree with the calculation, or you can try and measure that, be that effect. And then the other is a sort of a more top-down approach in which you suppose a principle of the theory without being specific about the theory and then find some testable contradiction. So for example, we don't know whether gravity would cause sort of spontaneous wave function collapse, but if it did, a massive superposition should decohere. And so you could look for such decoherence and if you don't find it, you would say, well, perhaps the spontaneous wave function collapse uh, needs, to, needs to go away. In either case, you can use improving theoretical knowledge to restrict theories, which then improves both of these types of tests. And I think it's also important, we talk about gravity, we're talking about quantum gravity, and we have to come to some sort of agreement about what we mean by quantum gravity. So I don't have all the answers. Uh, we talked about this quite a bit in piece uh, from about two years ago now in the classical and quantum gravity uh, that Dan Carney, my old postdoc, and Phil Stamp and I wrote. So if you want to kind of get the, the depth of this talk in paper form, I do encourage you to read that paper. It has a lot of this material in it. But I think the fundamental point is that, you know, you can kind of say what we mean by quantum gravity is really, does there exist a renormalizable theory of metric fluctuations that recovers Einstein's equations in the appropriate limits and is compatible with the standard model? So you could say this is, does there exist an effective field theory of gravity? You know, it's generally agreed, and since many in the theoretical and experimental community, that both gravitons and gravitational waves are the expected flat metric portion of the theory and should be detectable. Obviously, we've seen gravitational waves uh, through the LIGO experiment, but gravitons have been much trickier. You could also ask, really, is gravity a fundamental theory? Is it an emergent theory? I see that Ted Jacobson's on, on the call, he's obviously one of the great progenitors of the possibilities there. And also, is it even quantum? You know, is there some other interpretation of space time? Um, and some sort of two key aspects. One is what is the interpretation of space time? But then the other is quite simply, does gravity actually entangle things? And so I'd like to now dig into these uh, two different uh, ways of thinking about what we mean by quantum gravity, either that, hey, is there a effective field theory which has gravitons or alternatively, can we even say that gravity entangles or can we prove that it doesn't? So let's talk first about effective field theory tests. And the basic premise is that there exist gravitons. So in the sort of flat metric limit, so uh, low curvature limit, the gravitons are really analogous to photons. Um, they are the quanta of gravitational waves. And just like if you have a dipole emitting that, that couples to the electromagnetic field, you have spontaneous emission. If you have a mass quadruple coupled to the gravity to the metric, which every mass quadruple is, you should also get spontaneous emission. And this is a type of linearized field theory effective 
the gravitational decoherence. So uh, the key governing constant for electromagnetism is, of course, to find structure constant, right? Which is a, a dimensionless quantity that's essentially given the coupling strength squared in natural units of electromagnetism. So if you know the fine structure constant, you can also calculate the radiation rate from an atom, for example, with a dipole moment d, uh, obviously here measured in length, units of length, because I'm divided by electron charge, the fine structure constant, and then a ratio essentially set by density of states and the fact that it's a dipole transition. Now, what's interesting, of course, for gravitational radiation, the fine structure constant here is Newton's big G. And rather than the charge of the electron, it's the mass of the electron. And if you look at this in dimensionless units, you can also rewrite this as the mass of the electron compared to the Planck mass, quantity squared. As you may expect, this is a very small number. So if this is 10 to the minus 2, this is 10 to the minus 45. And that means that while you can, in principle, have some sort of gravitational decoherence, the coupling constants here are really, really hard to work with. Now, one advantage you have is that the quadruple here is a mass quadruple, so units of mass times length squared. And you're comparing a mass of something big to electrons, that's going to be a big number, but you still have to beat this 10 to the minus 45 in front. And you can run the numbers, and essentially you need something that where the gravitational background is a high temperature, you're working at very high frequencies, there's a large quadruple moment. It really starts to look like decoherence mechanisms for neutron stars, and I just don't see a way of doing it on Earth. Nonetheless, if you could observe this difference between stimulated emission and spontaneous emission of gravitons, you're good. We just don't think that these numbers are accessible on Earth. Why not? Well, I sometimes call this a dismal science of, gravi of gravity on Earth, which is that if you look at the natural combination of units for terrestrial experiments, you basically take Newton's constant, big G, and the physical parameters like material density. And this defines a gravitational coupling strength, zeta, which is units of frequency. It's just the square root of big G times density. And it's about a millihertz in, for, for, unit, for materials like um, tungsten, which is a high density, high quality material. I claim that this is actually a fundamental scale that's gonna govern any of the gravity experiments that we can conceive on Earth. So going back to that gravitational radiation, you can rewrite it in the following form, L being the size of the mass quadruple, lambda being the wavelength of the associated gravitational radiation. Here's your coupling constant zeta squared divided by frequency that gives you an overall units of frequency. And then you have the length compared to a harmonic oscillator length. So the small fluctuations of the quadrupole. And then you also have the length compared to the wavelength. In a similar way, if you look at the quantum mechanical coupling between two harmonic oscillators coupled by gravity. So this is a linearized expansion of the Newton's interaction. And you can see that you write this times harmonic oscillator length. You pull one mass over to the left, one mass over to the right. This quantity is your zeta quantity squared. And this quantity, is just h bar over omega. So this is units of energy, as you expect. And you see that the coupling constant in units of frequency is going to be typically less than a millihertz at best. So I hope this motivates this zeta parameter. And I would encourage others to think about zeta as a, a way of characterizing just how hard an experiment is going to be. So a nice thing to do would then be to show that gravity does, in fact, entangle things. So that would say that you have to have some quantum theory of gravity. You can't just get away with something semi-classical. And I, I think that I like to define another object based on the zeta parameter, which is the idea of ultra coherence. So ultra coherence is a massive object that has a positional coherence time that's an excess of this sort of theoretical quantum gravity limit, terrestrial quantum gravity limit. And so this gamma q is the quantum decoherence time. You want it to be less than zeta for some massive superposition. I will say that we're actually getting a little bit closer to this than I expected from 10 years ago. You know, the, the Q frequency limits for cryogenic materials are getting pretty good. And actually, if you look at free falling particles, like a trapped particle that you let go in a high vacuum, and you look at the effect of background gas and, and the uh, black body radiation inside the object, you can start to think that you might actually be able to get well below this value. So it's not inconceivable that with further advances in mechanical systems, in isolation from background materials and in vacuum systems, they will actually get to this ultra coherent regime in the course of the next decade. So for me, this is the biggest motivation to explore this direction. Now, uh, why would a massive superposition decohere? We don't really know. We can speculate though. All right, so 
one speculation is, is what I call the Penrose conjecture, um, with the sort of the DLC Penrose theories, in which you assume that to make gravity work, you have to, semi-classical gravity work, you have to have some decoherence of the systems, which leads, which prevents the contradictions that would be in, inherent in semi-classical gravity, semi gravity and quantum mechanics. And you can come up with like, equations like the Newton-Schrodinger equation, which is a, a sort of a guess at how this type of thing might work. You can come up with theories of gravitational decoherence, which become quite interesting and involved. You, I will note that you know, we have some additional reasons to be suspicious about Newton-Schrodinger, because if you have this sort of nonlinear equation governing quantum mechanics, then key assumptions in computational complexity collapse. For like, for example, BQP become, and P-space become equivalent. So you can solve any computational problem. It's similar in some respects to the problems you get when you allow for closed time-like curves. So in other words, time travel, where you get much more computational power than we expect should be there. Nonetheless, uh, you should look for this. And if you don't see it, declare some level of success. You know, there's other questions about equation of state gravity, you might call it saying, that, hey, if this is really a thermodynamic ensemble, perhaps there is no entanglement via gravity. And that would be a very interesting to show that you can't make entanglement via gravity. I did mention uh, that this master equation via gravitational waves also creating massive superpositions. I think the words of my colleague Bay Lock, who is a way to probe space-time texture at the quantum mechanical level. So these are very interesting questions, but I don't know really how to formulate, and others will probably do this better than I can, single particle massive superpositions. I'm much more interested in the two-body case. So let's talk briefly about this entangling question for two bodies. I want you to imagine I have two harmonic oscillators, one covered here by Alice, one here by Bob. Each of these behaves locally, quantum mechanically, and we have an induced gravitational interaction between them. So for small displacements from the equilibrium position, we write the gravitational interaction in a multipolar expansion. This prefactor here is that zeta parameter squared times the mass times x1, x2, where this is, again, small displacements, right? So you could try and entangle these two harmonic oscillators via this interaction. Now, when we think about what's going on under the hood, and uh, Phil Stamp has some disagreements about this slide here. I'll just say that uh, off the get-go, but nonetheless, this is a helpful way to think about how you get a, a local, a non-local interaction, like Newtonian interaction, out of a local Lorentz invariant theory. And the idea is that you have some gauge particle, like uh, here uh, represented by a bosonic operator A, and this gauge particle mediates the interaction between X1 and X2. So in the simplest possible limit, if you have this gauge boson uh, here with some frequency omega and a coupling, which is just given by x1 times the displacement of this field and x2 times the displacement of the field. You can try and integrate out the force carrier. So you say, let's look at frequencies much lower than this uh, back and forth time omega. And you can make a unitary transformation, a Polaron type transformation in which you're essentially saying, well, I'm gonna remove the linearized coupling between the fields and look at what happens afterwards. This is also similar, by the way, to what happens when you make the unitary transformations for the dipole approximation in electromagnetism. So when you do this, the vacuum field is actually displaced by a small amount that depends upon the positions of these two oscillators. So in this new frame, you have an effective interaction between the two objects mediated by the field and no object field interaction that's left. And that would seem to be a kind of nice way to create this interaction, but these are mathematically equivalent in the limit of high frequency. And so, you can use this construction to create a similar interaction, but one that doesn't entangle. And the idea is very simple. So over time, what's happening here is Alice and Bob are exchanging, if you will, virtual gauge bosons. But if you add a screen so that the, the gauge boson before it's allowed to propagate from Alice to Bob undergoes some screening interaction that removes any entangling character, you can still recover the semi-classical limit of the interaction but not have any quantum information communicated through the screen. And so if we think about the properties we're looking for, one is we wanted to sort of reproduce the classical dynamics or the Ehrenfress dynamics, if you will. At the same time, we wanna let no entanglement through. So about uh, eight years ago, my student, Devere Kafri and I sort of looked at this problem in some detail and solved it specifically for the case of harmonic oscillators. And what we showed is that over all possible non-entangling channels, so all possible screens you could put in the middle, there's a, a upper, there's a, a bound, a lower bound on how much the variance of the momentum of these particles changes over time if the channel is non-entangling. 
So G here is the quantum mechanical coupling between the two objects, which we said is going to be less than a millihertz. And the point is, if you can show that this noise is below this threshold, then there actually exists a protocol by which you can arbitrarily well purify the entanglement produced between these two masses. So this is a type of test. You're saying, let me look for this noise. If I do not see this noise, I have to confirm that there is some entanglement happening. And you can propose now sort of an example. I think we're going to see a lot of different examples of this nature over the course of the week, in which you have two, for example, harmonic oscillators here represented by torsional oscillators. These are oscillators that can spin about their axis, uh, dumbbells, if you will. And it's really motivated by the original Cavendish experiments uh, measuring G. And then you have some sort of superconducting shield that screens non-gravitational interactions between them, because you just want to see the gravitational part. You make them out of something very dense, like platinum in order to measure this coupling. And then you read them out optically or electrically. And the idea is you're looking for sort of an anomalous heating event in which the coupling between them uh, causes uh, an extra phonon about once every 3,000 seconds for the rates that we calculated for platinum. And of course, you have to contrast this to the thermal background for these objects, which we calculated using the best torsional oscillators for the Edward Foss group at the at University of Washington will be in the order of one phonon every 10 seconds. You know, so that's not so great. In principle, you can kind of try and run this experiment. You have to do several things. One, you have to verify that the coupling is actually due to gravity. You want to confirm the one over R law. You want to confirm the density dependence. And you also need to estimate the heating rate over a long time with a very high level of accuracy so that you can repeat it many, many times to look for a discrepancy. I basically think this is mostly impossible. It is, however, embarrassingly parallel. In principle, you could do it with many of these devices. So. I will mention just now briefly a new thing that we've been involved in uh, in collaboration um, with the Mueller Group at Berkeley, which is what I call a single-sided test of entanglement via gravity. So one of the big challenges in this type of experiment is that you're looking for entanglement between two different massive objects, both of which are hard to make quantum mechanical. And while you can come up with interesting entanglement witnesses, as, as uh, Bucko and, and uh, Bose have done and others, that measure both of these things, if you can reduce it to a problem where you just measure one object that you know how to do very well quantum mechanically, and then the other object, which becomes less important, it would make your life a lot easier. So we figured out the simplification just the, over the summer, we put the paper up in the archive in January. But the idea is you can actually test under certain constraints, which I'll talk about, the idea of entanglement via gravity using measurements only on one of the two systems. And the idea is actually to use what you call entanglement-induced collapse and revival of coherence. I'm certain you've seen this type of plot in which you have two systems interacting. You may have some sort of Ramsey fringe, for example, some oscillations. But over long times, the overall coherence of the oscillation goes down and then recovers. That's called revival. So what we were thinking about in this case was a scenario where I have a harmonic oscillator with a big mass. This is in the case of pendulum, for example. And I have an atom in a trap. This is a type of atom in a ferrometer in which I'm going to split the atom into two pathways, hold it at some distance L. Now, if it's on the left side, this thing sees a force this way, right side, it sees a force that way. And so over time, this pendulum starts to move. And then, at, then we try and recombine the atoms and measure where they are. And again, that would produce this signal. So the fast oscillations, are due to the difference, differential force the atom sees. And the slow oscillations are due to the entanglement of the atoms with the mass. But when the mass makes a full circuit of its dynamics, so it goes out and then back again, it actually becomes disentangled. And so in principle, you can recover the atomic coherence. So what are the assumptions that make this into a test? Well, I have Alice and I have Bob. And I have some channel, quantum channel, between them. And the idea is that this channel, we have two constraints. One, it generates time evolution in a manner consistent with time translation invariance and obeys the semigroup composition law. So that is that the channel from T to T double prime is equal to the channel from T to T prime, followed by the channel from T prime to T double prime for any uh, ordering of T of this nature. The second key point is that the observed subsystem, this two-level, this qubit, if you will, A, has a dynamics generated by the channel, which is a trace over the other system, which preserves the population of the two states and non-monotonically changes the interferometric visibility. So that is to say that K 
on sigma z equals sigma z and the visibility changes sign, for example, by oscillating periodically. If both of these are true, then L is not a separable channel. And that means it can, it can convey entanglement. So by the way, this semigroup means that L has a Lindblad form. So it, its generators are in Lindblad form. And this revival is equivalent of a coherence transfer from one system to the other and back. So here's that, again, harmonic oscillator concept. You can think about it the following way. So I start in the center. I put the atom in a superposition in two locations. That effectively produces a, a force, which is a displacement on these two objects. It evolves over time. And if at the end I put the atom back, that undoes the displacement. And then I can say, is this thing far away from that thing? So these are the two different pathways that the mass could have gone, gone through. And the overlap between these will determine the coherence. So I think, uh, um, um, sorry, the, uh, the Wheeler group, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but, but basically you can imagine a scenario where you set up some masses, you have uh, atoms like this, they have a beautiful approach for trapping atoms in an atom interferometer. So what they do in that type of experiment is they have an atom interferometer. So here's a cloud of atoms, they hit it. This is in time, this is space. This is the Z axis here. They hit it, it goes into superposition of two locations. It has two different momenta. And then they uh, hit the sort of reflection point so that they go to uh, the same point of the apex of their trajectory upward in, in Earth's gravity. And then they turn on an optical lattice. And the optical lattice will trap the atoms for an extended period of time on the order of say 20 seconds. And then uh, they will recombine the atoms in an at interferometric signal at, at the end of the experiment. And so if you, if you run the numbers, you find that this thing, first of all, actually has some interesting behavior. It can improve with temperature of the massive system. So random but massive, random but uh, strong motion of the masses is better. It requires high density, as we tried to talk about. It's a small prefactor, as you may expect. Works better with bigger atomic masses, works better with uh, larger, super, larger uh, superpositions here and with longer times. But what we discover is actually, if you're doing on the order of 10 to the four experiments with 10 to the seven atoms each, in principle, you can actually test this to the five sigma level in about two months of running. So now we went from something like 3000 years of runtime for the two-sided experiment to two months with the one-sided experiment. So I'm very excited about that. Now, I have uh, not that much more time left, but I wanna talk about the, the third sort of test for quantum gravity here on earth. And that is actually connecting some of the theoretical knowledge we have of what happened in the early universe with searches for dark matter. And in particular, you can ask, can we make dark matter that only interacts with gravity? And there's a beautiful talk by Andrew Long uh, at GATP uh, from last year, which I encourage you to take a look at. And uh, some of this material, this slide and the next in particular, were drawn really from his work. So you can ask what type of dark matter is created uh, in the early universe? So one thing, is that near inflation, if there is coupling to the standard model, you're at high enough temperatures, so you can basically go from a standard model plasma through a graviton to a dark sector with this vertices weighted by the Planck mask. But actually, even if there's no standard model coupling, just the actual inflation itself, so in the uh, FLRW metric in the early universe, you can write down the, the Lagrangian for this type of uh, a scalar field theory, for example, and what you get is that there's a, an effective mass which has the Ricci curvature in it and, and also the Ricci scalar in it and also has the conformal uh, growth constant A. And the consequence basically is that in the early universe, the effective mass of the scalar field is changing in time. And when the effective mass is changing in time, the ground state wave function has to adjust to the changing mass. So, you know, very, very viscerally, if here is a tight confinement and I have a tightly confined harmonic oscillator wave function, over time, this will become much more weakly confined, this spreads out, but the problem is that this may not be able to adjust adiabatically to that because this is growing exponentially. And the consequence is that you left behind, you leave behind some excitations in this, in this system, and those could be the dark matter. And so if you can, I will say that the consequence, by the way, is that there's a natural scale given roughly speaking by the early universe uh, Hubble constant, which gives you somewhat below Planck mass, but close to the Planck mass for dark matter particles. And so you could try and say, hey, is there very heavy, so Planck mass scale, dark matter, sometimes called WIMP zillas. And how would you measure this? So uh, if it's only interacting by gravity, you have to measure its gravitational effect. So if you have a, a test mass here and a dark matter particle here with some impact parameter B and uh, momentum, 
mass times this velocity here. So taking the non-relativistic limit. As it comes by, it'll have a small deflection because of the gravitational interaction, right? So it goes by and this thing gets an impulse laterally. You can calculate the deflection angle in terms of my little zeta. Remember, that's the square root of big G times the density now of this mass. You can also calculate the impulse, how much momentum is transferred to this object. And it's basically given by the zeta parameter squared times the interaction time, which is set by the intact parameter times the initial momentum. It turns out that we believe you can actually measure this level of impulse if you're careful. Let's give a little impulse background. So if you have a five milligram dark matter, so that's um, substantially heavier than the Planck mass, Planck mass being about uh, 20 micrograms, then, and you have a five milligram sensor, the impulse delivered is in the order of 10 to the minus 19. Now, that's actually not so bad. We can already do a billion optical photons in a pulse, which is also 10 to the minus 19 kilograms meters per second. Um, you know, if you're in the ultra coherent regime, you can see that actually the thermal noise background for a five milligram mass is actually below, well below the impulse that you get at this level for reasonable amounts of integration time. You can also ask what happens if your background gas hits the system. So for example, a single helium atom at four Kelvin hitting a mass produces an impulse about 10 to the minus 24. Uh, if you go down to the sort of sub, sub Planck mass level, now you're really getting interesting, really challenging. You want to make the sensor kind of small as well for a variety of reasons, but the basic problem is that this becomes quite small and you really need to get that background gas load down below 10 to the minus 13 tor. So, you know, there's, there's what you could probably do with current technology. There's what you might try and focus on for the, for the future generations. Uh, there's sort of a standard quantum limit for momentum transfer and you need to actually get well below that. We have some nice work on that recently. But the, this whole idea of trying to measure dark matter as gravitational interaction and just trying to infer if there is such heavy dark matter has become a large collaboration called the Winchheim Collaboration, uh, spread across Purdue, Fermilab, Rice, Maryland, Oak Ridge, Minnesota, Berkeley, and NIST. And the idea is to create a, basically something like a bubble chamber, but where each of the objects in this thing, this blue pendula, have been excited by dark matter particle going through. And you look for correlated tracks of these excited particles. You can read more about it in our proposal paper back from uh, two years ago now and some more recent work uh, on the archive. But it's very, very challenging. I wanna be clear about that. You know, you're looking for dark matter that's in Planck mass scale here. So this, by the way, is the mass in, in the GEV, Planck mass is right about there. And this is now uh, on the order of between one, 10 million and one billion sensors forming in the array. You can make the spacing larger, which creates a number of detectable events per year to be higher, which is good. Uh, but then, you have kind of a, a maximum, uh, in, uh, a minimum mass you can measure, which is well above Planck mass. You make them more closely spaced and you can now uh, see to lower masses uh, at a cost and event rate. You can go to lower masses and then uh, becomes more challenging. I mean, we, we think though that this stuff is really on the edge of possible, right? Because now you're looking at the sort of, you know, one to 10 events per year. And this is assuming they're able to get thermally limited. So that means you have to have substantial back action evasion in this type of effort. Nonetheless, you know, what are the scientific frontiers here? So actually one of the questions that we have is, uh, is you know, what are the fundamental limits for this small detection of forces and impulses? It's gonna be critical for both entanglement tests and also for this dark matter type test. I think the answer, by the way, is yes, we could probably detect dark matter if it's heavy enough uh, through its gravitational interaction, but it is heroic. Um, of course, along the way, you should also be asking, hey, as we build all of these different apparatus, what are the other physics targets that we can look for? What are the other physics that we'll learn? So I'd like to think about that as we go through the talks throughout the, the uh, work today. And then finally, you know, what can you learn about quantum effects and gravity? So I've, I've laid out two different pathways, but I think there's a lot more out there. So I'm really looking forward to the rest of the talks. And I want to thank everyone for the time. I just want to mention at the end here, uh, I call up my old postdoc, Dan Carney, who's now at Berkeley, at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory who drove a lot of this work, my students, Sahit Gosh and John Kuniaman, who have been doing a lot of the calculation work, and my new postdoc, Jeff Epstein, who has come from Berkeley and uh, is joining the group to work on more of these semi-classical theories of gravity. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Jake, for the very nice and stimulating talk. Uh, so I have seen already some uh, hand raised. Uh, Diego, do you want to go ahead and, and ask the question? Hi, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, it was super, super nice talk. I guess my question is going to be shared by other 
participants. It's like uh, uh, what happens with other models of dark matter where you have direct direct interaction with the with the sample, right? Uh, I guess if you are able to do, to see the gravitational uh, coupling, you also will be able to 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 have super strong constraints on direct coupling. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, when it comes to dark matter that has a standard model coupling, we have two different interesting things. So first of all. Uh, it's going to be harder to say it's a test of quantum gravity, right? <laughs> because it's not gravitationally motivated. It's standard model sure, motivated. Sure. Uh, but nonetheless, if you're building these detectors, you want to know, are you also sensitive to, for example, light or dark matter or through standard model coupling? The answer is yes. So we wrote some papers about it uh, for the ultralight dark matter. Uh, and so you, you can read about it. But, but in terms of you know, what we're focused on today, uh, it's really only this very high mass regime where gravity is implicated. For the ultralight dark matter, for, for light dark matter and other types of WIMPs, it, it's hard to say that gravity is necessarily part of the story, that gravity has to be quantum. Whereas if it's purely gravitationally coupled and you create it in inflation, it's gotta be metric fluctuations. That's all we got. And so, you know, I would say that if we can show that you see these things and there's no standard model cross section, which if they had a standard model cross section, it would change the, the what the sensor sees. You know, that's that's a smoking gun. All right, so let me go to the next questions. Um, uh, I think the next one that I saw was Arkady. Uh, hello, sir. thanks for the talk. And, uh... No, I'm not sure whether it's a question because uh, I try, try to follow the idea about this discussing, uh, you know, uh, quantum. It seems to me a little bit uh, kind of interchange with the point that um, if you consider non-relativistic objects, and I believe that it was consideration in this first part about non-relativistic objects, then... Uh, we have just uh, what is called instantaneous interaction, which is a normal potential energy. Uh, and uh, in this sense, I mean, uh, um, relation to exchange by graviton, for example, whatever it appears when you are trying to, to make it consistent with Lorentz invariance. But let's uh, say that we are talking about non realistic system. Okay, then it's just a normal quantum mechanical system with certain type of uh, potential. Okay, so in this respect, uh, it is the same as, for example, for electromagnetic interaction, which is also kind of long range. Uh, but uh, and then uh, you know all these qu questions about coherence and coherence. It's not specific for qu quantum gravity in this respect. So, so uh, what I'm trying to say is that when we are going to to strong gravity, when deviation from flat. Flatness is, is uh, can, you know is big. Then, then indeed we can discuss what is quantum, what is uh, non-quantum, uh, how to interpret this. And uh, but classical field theory um, for uh, you know gravitational field, if we are talking about this small uh, small, uh, small amplitude of the field, I do not see any, any any specificity of this because everything could be done in a standard way. So so okay. No, in this way I I'm okay. I'm uh, a little bit confused about so, uh, the point. Yeah, I, I will say I'm, I'm very fortunate that uh, Phil Stamp has a recent paper that digs in exactly to the question you're coming about, which is, so if I'm looking at the relativistic limit, you know, why, why do I need to have some sort of a local theory in the non-relativistic limit? And, you know, uh, and there's another way to think about it, right, is that by, if, if you choose an appropriate gauge, because these are gauge theories, if you choose an appropriate gauge, then there's a direct matter-matter interaction. It's not right? about gauge. I disagree. It's, it has nothing to do with the gauge. It's a normal uh, energy of the system in an relativistic limit, and it's not, it's gauge independent in an relativistic limit. No, I, okay, I agree. I agree. Um, and uh, uh, so the, I guess what I'm trying to say, though, is that if you if you have a theory with this interaction, there will be dynamical corrections to that theory in order to ensure Lorentz invariance. That's true. I agree. Right. And so, you know, when we talk about what we can do here on Earth, 
we have, we're going to run into problems like there will be loopholes. So the loophole that I would think about in that context, right, is that while you could, for example, show that you're not able to make entanglement through this gravitate, what you think is a gravitational channel, what you really want to do is show that the dynamical correction doesn't work either, right? And so that's, that's why it's like, I, I can't say that there's a way to get around loopholes. No, At least no, not, not that I could conceive today. No, it's not a loophole because in this way, you can ask the same question with electromagnetic interaction. And you know, yes. the invariance requires that we, we do have, say, photons, right? And here we yeah. also have uh, uh, kind of, uh, um, you know, a propagating object, which is we can call graviton. Until uh, and it is uh, everything in in the uh, this semi-classical range in in this uh, respect. So so if there is any kind of deviation, whatever it would be beyond this. So I guess the point actually is that uh, this is what I said at the beginning, right? Many people believe linearized gravity is a great starting point. Yeah. And the point of these entanglement tests is that they're actually asking. They're asking actually asking about linearized gravity first, like. Do we even have proof for linear as gravity at the quantum mechanical level? That's what they're asking. I, I, I see. I understand that. But I, I, I see that there is no doubt about the existence of linear as gravity. So, so in this way, I, it's a theoretically sol solvable problem. It, it doesn't need experiment. Okay, well, except that then, if you, if you do the experiment then, and it never entangles, then you learn something. <laughs> sure. Well, thank you. Great. So, uh, I mean, we will have more discussions later. So I'm, I'm going to take, uh, because I want to stay on time, so I'm going to take two more questions and then we will have more time for the discussion. That's, that's the idea. So I think the next person I saw was John. Um, I'm, I'm trying to feel, keep the order. Hopefully I'm okay seeing the right no answer. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you for your, your talk, Jacob. Um, so I have two questions. I mean, this, this proposed test using the uh, four sensors, you have to suppress indeed thermal noise and other things tremendously. By, by, yes. Do you have any realistic expectation you can get a 50 decibel of suppression? Um, so is, actually, the, the 50 decibels of back action evasion mm -hmm. and the like is or, in order to get to the thermal limit. Just to be clear. Oh. So okay. oh, those fair plots enough, were you, you, thermally you, you, limited you, you, plots. Yes, okay. Right. And people and? have demonstrated the, the thermal limit side of that actually in the past, but without good enough readout. Hmm. So there's this balance. You have to be able to see enough of the signal, but not have too much noise. And the problem is that um, you're looking for something that's happening at high frequencies. So dark hmm. matter, we think, is not de is a little bit decoupled from our gravitational rotation, yeah. or rotation in the, in the galaxy. So the stuff comes by very fast. You know, some, uh, uh, not, rel not relativistic. No, 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 I know. It's point, point yeah. zero zero five C or something, you know, so it's like, a, it's fast. And well, consequently, no, 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 it's 10 to the minus three of C. That's what I, well, okay. I yeah, said yeah. 10 to the minus three times a free constant, oh, oh. which is, oh, okay. so, yeah. Um, yeah, but it goes by quickly. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have a sensor that sees this, but you need a long enough integration time because what you want something massive at the same time. So there's this balancing act because it's hard for a large mass to respond quickly. And that balancing act basically ends up putting you in a tight corner in the measurement side. So you can move yourself to an easier spot in measurement by making things lighter, but then your, the number of sensors you need goes up. Yeah. So my take is that uh, 50 dB of combined back action evasion and quantum non demolition is the very outer limit of what we can achieve with a 30 year program. That's my take. Mm -hmm. Okay. Incidentally, can I remember, Mark, there's other, there's other purely gravitational production mechanisms other than the inflation windzilla. I mean, that gives you a wider yes. range of masses. So there, there, are, there are a whole bunch of other gravitational mechanisms out there. I, I agree. I agree. I think the point is that if you, if you create dark matter from gravity, mm. one way or the other, it really is a smoking gun that high curvature gravity has to be quantum. I mean, that's my take. Uh, no, there are mechanisms that don't require gravity to be quantum. I disagree with that. But we can talk offline oh. about that. Yeah, that'd be great. Love yeah. to hear. Right. Sure. Great. Hey, I think the last, the next one is Anupan. Uh, so uh, thanks, Jake. It's a lovely talk. I just want to ask. Uh, so what's the acceleration do you uh, require? Because it's all working with the uh, because of the relative acceleration which is imparting on your mass. So yes. effectively, you are building a the world class sensor, which is very beautiful. We, this is what we want. But uh, what is the relative acceleration can it measure? Yeah, so, so I, I put things in terms of impulse rather than acceleration. 
because this thing comes through like a shot and you're looking for a change in momentum from the impulse. Um, but the, the corresponding uh, noise floors that you're looking for are actually something that we've achieved at lower frequencies. So it's in this sort of um, pico G per root hertz levels of sensitivity. And those are the world's best accelerometers. Mm -hmm. You can actually get away with worse if you have more sensors up to about a uh, nano G per root hertz. I've actually built a sensor that works at nano G per root hertz and I'm a theorist. I mean, come on, uh, <laughs> but no more seriously. Uh, uh, you know, the range depends on some of the uh, other choices, uh, but you are looking in that, in that region. So it's, it's the acceleration floors we're looking at are similar to what we can do today with the best sensors. But the problem is that your bandwidth is much different because you're looking to measure something at a microsecond, not in a second. So, so my next I mean, point is that in order to really do this kind of like nano G, which you said, which is exactly this kind of regime where you would love to, perhaps you would you would expect that the entire system to be kind of like a free fall system somewhere, either in so the space or maybe underground free fall laboratory where you can get rid of the seismic noise or serpent slithering past through my experimental lab or something like that. These are all great questions. Actually, so there's two different pathways that we look at, right? So one is using chip-based systems, which are cold damped. So basically you're re measuring them, reading them out and feeding back on them. So all the low frequency stuff is integrated out and you only see the high frequency. And that's like the semiconductor industry approach, like right? make it many, many things per chip, many, many chips. And then the other approach is to uh, use levitated small objects with optical lattices levitate them all at once and let them all drop. And so, you know, Dave Moore at Yale, for example, is looking in that direction, whereas the Purdue team is looking at the chip-based approach. But in both cases, you need many, many sensors. And the whole reason you need sensors is to reject background because you want to see a track, correlated track from a long range force and not an individual muon that hit something and knocked it. And so that's, that's a, a key point there. Thanks, thank you very much. Thank you. Great. I think we have time for one short questions. I thought before I saw Lance, I don't know if you want to or just wait until the discussion. Sure. I wasn't sure if you had time. Uh, that was very interesting talk. Uh, Jake, uh, can you show your sensitivity plot again? I was curious about, uh, I mean, there should be a well-defined line that's your target for uh, WIMPs, and I wasn't sure if I saw it in terms of mass versus flux. Also. Yeah, I mean, while you're finding that, maybe, yeah. So where, where is, isn't there a specific events per year that you can just draw for the dark matter halo here? Uh, yeah, so, um, so the events, so we're assuming the existing dark matter halo is almost entirely at some mass, okay? Yeah. And then the events per year is how much of the dark matter halo we actually see. Okay, and if you see all of it? Which line no, is that? I mean, what do you mean by see all of it? Like the point is the dark matter halo is comprised of small particles. The particles yeah. come whizzing by the earth. Some yeah. of them go through our detector of that, of those ones that go through our detector. Some of them are above our threshold for noise. Right. So if you ask like, what is the, what is the sort of cross section of these types of detectors? It depends on how many sensors, but at the, at the billion sensor scale, the cross section is some sort of 10 meters squared. Okay, so events per year is just the function of the area of your detector or something like that. It's the area of detector, uh, the, the, the functional and your area sensitivity of the detector rate. and your sensitivity yeah. limit. Okay, yeah. anyway, so I see how you phrased it. Okay, so as long as I see something that's, uh, uh, okay, anyway. Now, now so the point is, this question of whether yeah. uh, if you see something in this mass range that it shows quantum gravity. I mean, I, I think you can, you know, we, we have, there could be some other secluded sector that produces uh, heavy stuff that is made up of agglomerations of light stuff, like you know neutron stars or cue balls or, or a variety yeah. of things. So how how do you know you haven't found that? I, I just don't see that this is a so, smoking gun for uh, quantum. So gravity. I think what you're there's two different things you're looking for. First of all, you're looking for the existence of such dark matter, and second, you're looking for the fact that it didn't have a short range interaction. You mean with uh, the, our standard model, but that's easy yeah. to arrange. You just have some, uh, you know, something that it, it could talk to the standard model through 10 to the 10th GeV suppressed interactions and it'd effectively be gravitational. Yeah, right? so I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that assessment. And I guess for me, 
if you had a data constraint on the mass of dark matter, I think we'd get a much better sense of whether or not the inflation driven scenario is the right scenario. So I guess I would say it's a way to get closer to it, but then you have other predictions which could be in contradiction. So yeah, I, I don't disagree. It's not a it's not ironclad. Okay. But it, anyway, it, is, it would be very nice to know if, if be nice to know, matter right? is uh, you know one one TeV or uh, Planck scale or above until you hit macho limits and stuff like that. Yeah, That'd be great. Well, what's maybe be less appreciated, but is important to note here. This this is the first time I think that anyone had proposed that we could actually measure dark matter up in that range. You know, there you can measure dark matter up at at sort of a planet scale, yeah. and you can measure dark matter down in the in the sort of you know, TeV down through micro EV range, right? That's been proposed in many ways, but this sort of regime of this intermediate spot where there's not that many and they're no, very that's heavy. That's a great uh, regime to have <laughs> some coverage for. Yeah, so we're excited about that, obviously. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. So thanks, Jake, for the very nice talk.